Thank you very much. Uh, as, actually, first of all, let me thank organizers. I think I'm here the second time, and the second time is a very interesting conference. So it is definitely worthwhile uh, for, for being here. And thank you a lot for, for that. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, I'm indeed Mikhail Anufriev. I'm from Sydney, UTS. Uh, this is the work with my co-author, Valentin Panchenko, who is from UNSW, also Sydney-based university. Um, we did this work because we were bored, because we were waiting, waited for some data set, which they promised us to give, and so we could have a look at that. But we didn't have this data set because uh, Australian Prudential Authority wanted to, to check everything, so we had to sign something, I don't know. In any case, so we didn't know what to do, so <laughs> essentially we tried to uh, build a network of the dependencies between banks or financial entities without looking at the raw data. So the question was how to do this. The presentation is called Connecting the Dots, so which dots are we connecting? We try to find some relationship between three areas, so I don't know how, how you are familiar with it. I'm not much familiar with uh, first, for example, but uh, I will try to explain more or less what it is. So the first area is the econometric modeling, financial econometrics modeling on uh, correlations. So, okay, you can compute a correlation matrix of financial entities. And what people often do when they look at the data, they try to reduce the dimensionality of the data because, of course, the dimension can be very large. The number of time periods can be very large. That's the, the dimension, essentially. And so what they try to do, they try to look on so-called principal components or, or also related factor analysis. So you often look on this several, just few number of factors, which are kind of directions where most of the variance of, of the data uh, emerges. So it's, it's useful to only look at those directions. This is the first literature. There is a big literature there. And then there is a second literature, which we discovered. It's called Gaussian graphical models. It's a statistical literature. And what these people are doing, they are building the network of partial correlations, not normal correlations as the first branch, but of the partial correlations, uh, in order to, 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 to find uh, parts of the networks which can be, in a sense, decomposed, or can be uh, not affecting or not affected by each other. Okay, so we are actually inspired mostly by this approach, but what we want to do, we try to attempt to relate it to the network theory in economics, and in particular to those centrality measures about which, uh, for example, Matt spoke uh, yesterday. So in terms of my presentation, I will start <coughs> with explanation of what is partial correlation. Essentially, I will explain how it is related to the networks. Uh, we'll talk a little bit what I think can be in relation with the network-based measures. And as an application, as an example, I will show uh, the exercise of this applied to Australian banks, economic sectors, and international markets. So what you will see in the end, you will see a network of, of these entities where every node will be some of the entity and where each H, which imply that there is a some non-zero partial correlation between these entities. The motivation for the network approach for the financial uh, data uh, kind of clear now. There are many possible citations. This is a citation from the macroeconomist and policymaker. He says, in the current crisis, we have seen that financial firms have become too interconnected to fail, pose serious problems for financial stabilities and for regulators. Due to the interconnectivity of today's financial markets, the failure of a major counterparty has the potential to severely disrupt many other financial institutions. Okay, so this actually calls to the network uh, illustration, and you would like to see this network as a way of thinking of propagation of probably some shocks, because the interconnectedness would be exactly captured by the network. Number of contributions in these uh, fields are, are, are large. Uh, these are just 2014 papers, and those which I only read, and so these are theoretical network models here. And what usually theoretical network models do, they, of course, they uh, either start with a network or they try to build a network, and then on this network they, they propose some, some ways of studying how these shocks are propagating. They apply sometimes to the some data sets, but, of course, in order to apply to some data sets, you, ha you have to have these data sets available. And uh, 
the data is always a possible <laughs> issue. Uh, and so another approach is this empirical network approach, which is called reconstructed networks. So when you look on some data which do not have a network, but you reconstruct it from, from that data. And so what we are doing, we are doing this. But differently from other people. Okay, so let me tell you what are partial correlations. Uh, well, what, what are the correlations between random variable? I think we all more or less know. The, they measure the tendency of this uh, random variable to move in the same direction from their mean, if this is positive or in, in different direction if it is negative. So the partial correlations measures this linear dependence in a similar way, but conditional on the linear dependences between all the other entities. Okay, so suppose we have as in our application, about 20 financial entities. We will observe the returns of these entities. We will be interested in the correlation between these returns over time. And these correlations, uh, when you see them and the realizations, they of course depend on the realizations of all other entities. So in order to, to, to think about network, it seems that it's more natural to condition on all the rest. And so that the correlation between the two entities who just measure the linear dependence between them, condition and all the rest. Of course, the total effect will be measured somehow by the total usual correlation, but the partial correlation will measure this conditional effect. Okay, so I will use this notation, rho ij, uh, just short notation, that's the definition of partial correlation. Then the network which you will see will have nodes, the nodes will correspond to the returns, xi, so these are the nodes, and the edges will correspond to those nodes which have non-zero partial correlation between them. Okay, to proceed a little bit further, I think it's useful to establish some relationship with linear regressions, which we actually are all familiar. So we have remembered, so the x is a a uh, random variable which has a number of random variable components there, the financial entities. And so take one of them and regress it, the mean, and regress it on the, all the others. So the equation which you see here, I can, okay, so here, this is this exercise. You, for any i, you regress this variable on all the others. And then you look also, and you have some uh, residuals. So beta ij is the effect of xj in this regression on xi. Okay, so it turns out that when you write this for any i, you have the system of equation. In order to have the orthogonality condition, so in order to have that epsilon, the residuals, really are independent on xj, you should have this equality. So you can show it that for random process multivariate random variable, these components x1 and so on xn, these regressions will have orthogonal residuals only if betas are related to those rho which were partial correlations through this equality. Okay, so what is here? Epsilon is the residual, sigma is the variance covariance of these residuals, and these are variances of epsilons in, which stays on the diagonal of that big sigma. So what, for example, you see here that if these residuals in the regression would have exactly the same variances, then the partial correlation would be exactly the betas, and betas would be therefore symmetric. So when you run regression of xi on all others, and you look on the coefficient in front of xj, and vice versa, you would have exactly the same beta. But generally, we will have different betas, so the matrix of betas will be asymmetric, not symmetric. But the matrix of rho, they are symmetric. So this, this uh, normalization of betas uh, takes care of it. Okay, so this is just a statistical fact. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to rescale each of these variables, and I'm going to rescale them in a, some way, in a strange way. So, uh, what this rescaling uh, says, that you take the random variable, you subtract the mean, well, so, so far so good, then you divide on the standard, it looks like standard deviation, but this is not the standard deviation of xi, because usually you rescale it and you divide on unconditional standard deviation of xi. This is the conditional standard deviation of xi. That is conditional on all others, 
the variance of epsilon i is the condition of variance of xi. And so this is uh, a little bit of uh, strange. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Well, this is the object which just looks like important here. Uh, and I think the, con the, the division, the, well, division by the conditional variance exactly is here natural because you want to uh, condition on all other components. So you look on the conditional variances. In the same way, after you uh, normalize epsilon i, you get ei. And so that equation above is just this equation. OK, so I'm now going to look at this equation. I can also write them in mat it in matrix form. And so here p is the matrix of partial correlations, the matrix which has 0 on the diagonals. And this row coefficients, which are usually small, in our applications, they are almost always positive between 0 and 1, but mostly closer to 0 of this partial correlation. OK, so this is the uh, statistical uh, equality of, uh, of the data. Now I have to be careful here, because whatever I'm going to tell here, you should all remember that I remember that correlation doesn't imply the causation. So the problem is that looking in the correlations, we don't know what causes what, of course. Uh, but observationally, we know that if one of the variables is uh, like taken out of the natural state, then others will be affected. And the relationship of, of this effect is captured by this equation, where P is the matrix of partial correlation. So imagine that initially all the variables were in mean. And then E, which you may think as a shock, hit the system. Well, actually, maybe you just observed that there was something with the variables. And you think that it was a shock which caused this. OK, so of course, then P times C would be the first effect of this shock. So what is P times C? P times C is just the, uh, well, you know, this, the sum of this partial correlations over the vectors of the shock. So if the shock, for example, comes in particular by one component to one, to this to this node one, then uh, and, and one has an edge with three, so it means that they have a correlation between them. Then three, you'll get this shock in one period of time, so in one step. And P will measure this. And then P square E will measure the second uh, step, so it may also go back and it may go here, it may go here. P third, P, P to the third E is the third effect, third order effect, and so on. And so we may say that P power K times C, this is K's order effect of this shock. Um, and when you sum them up, you in principle should get the total effect, which is probably the observable. OK, so the sum of all these shocks should be equal to this. Well, I think mathematically it may not, because this may diverge. But suppose it converges. And then you get that as the result. And you, of course, can also get this directly from that equation. You see that x depends on this, in, uh, on e in this way. OK, so this matrix would give you the total effect of the shock. But with the partial correlation matrix, we are able to decompose it on some way on the direct, less direct, and so on effects. OK. Now, the total effect of the shock probably should be related, if you ask econometricians, we tested it, should be related to variance-covariance matrix. That is not the partial correlation matrix, but just the correlation matrix. OK, well, actually, it is. And this is how. Another piece of uh, statistical uh, analysis for us revealed the following about this partial correlation. There is uh, a magic relationship between partial correlation row and the inverse of variance-covariance matrix. So if omega is a variance-covariance matrix of x, call k, uh, they call it often concentration matrix. So this is the inverse of it. And form this uh, formula from the elements of this k. Turns out that this ratio will be exactly partial correlation, rho ij. And in matrix form, you can write exactly the same by this equation. OK, so what happens is that you look at the uh, non-diagonal elements of ij, and you normalize them with the diagonal elements of k. So while I don't know the effect, what, what, what really measures kij, 
I actually know what measures KI and KJJ. It turns out that they are exactly the, ever, the inverse of variance of um, epsilon, of those residuals in the, re in the linear regression, which was here in a couple of slides before. So you actually can write the diagonal decay there as this one. And so eventually from that equation, you, with simple algebra, you get that. So remember, this was the matrix which was in front of the shock, and that would measure the total effect. So let's call this matrix of the total effect. It turns out that this is related to the variance-covariance matrix, but that is not exactly the variance-covariance matrix. That's the matrix which is um, normalized by variances of, of epsilons. That is by conditional variances of x's, conditional no other. So now we know that if partial correlation matrix would have an interpretation of one step uh, propagation of the shock, then the total effect will be measured by this. Okay, so how does it, how is it connected with the centrality measures? Uh, I, I, I don't know fully. I, I agree actually that the, there are many centrality measures and it's very useful to know and to have a direct interpretation for each of that. Okay, so in this case, what we can say, of course, we can compute degree of centrality of the network of partial correlations. That will be the, in, in, probably the sum of weights of all adjacent edges because we have the weighted matrix, the partial correlations are weights, so the degree would be the sum of these weights. Okay, in principle, if you have a node with a high degree, it means that either it has a high weight for some entity or it has many entities with maybe small weights or both. And so it basically means that it should be important in getting the shocks and also transmitting the shocks intuitively. Now, eigenvector centrality takes into account the centrality of neighbors, uh, and it is defined like the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue of matrix, and in this case of matrix P, of partial correlation matrix. And so let's actually see a little bit on what it is. If we remember, this is the case effect of the shock. Uh, you define u, so u1 and so on, un, these are eigenvectors. Uh, write e0 as the sum of them. Make some obvious computations. Use the definition of eigenvalues. And so what you find here, you find that if lambda1, this is the eigenvalue corresponding, uh, this is the largest eigenvalue, uh, then all these uh, ratios, apart from the ratio for i equal to 1, would, would go to 0. Uh, when k goes to infinity. And so you would have only lambda 1 here, power k, and then power k again. So this, this would be only this lambda 1 times this sum, where you have the u1 on the place of ui. And so u1 would be the vector which would accumulate the shock and the case iteration when k goes to infinity. OK, what does it mean? So if the um, some entity has a high centrality, it may mean two things at least. Well, on the one hand, it means that if the shock E has a high coordinate for the, uh, for the uh, entity with high centrality, then it should have actually high effect for everybody else in the future. But it also may mean that this entity will get also high shock eventually. So again, because we don't know about the causation here, it's hard to interpret, but in principle, this eigenvector would accumulate the shocks on the kth uh, iteration. Now, you may then think about this generalization. You may take the first p uh, eigenvectors, the first p in the sense corresponding to the largest p eigenvalues. How many p's you should take? Well, it depends probably, but you would like to take those. If they are close to each other, this largest, you would like p, which are quite close to each other. And then, in principle, the space spanned by these vectors would asymptotically accumulate the shocks. Now, this thing, that's actually thing which is what is done in principal component analysis. Again, so I said that they are applying principal component usually to variance-covariance matrix. But what we can show that the eigen uh, vectors of P are exactly the same as eigen vectors of this matrix. And eigenvalues are not the same, but they are exactly in the same order. So that means, actually, that if you apply the centrality, this p-centrality space, 
uh, for the matrix P, it's the same as to apply principal component analysis uh, to, to this matrix, but not to the covariance covariance. Okay, so it seems that there is this. Now, I don't know what exactly, I maybe I, I should ask Matt, but I, I don't know what is exactly the interpretation of the centrality space. Of course, the eigenvector centrality, would, you would like to get it positive. So that's one of the reasons why you take the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue for the positive matrices. But these would, of course, have uh, negative uh, components. But still, if you are able to imagine somehow the, the space, this is the space where the shocks would go. So might be useful. Now also there is another centrality measure which is Bonacci centrality. You can write the definition. So here you accumulate the degree centrality and then you have a dampening factor for the neighbors and you uh, look, so this is alpha, this is dampening factor and, and so on. And so eventually you get something like that and with some computations we found that if you take alpha equal to one, so it should be not bold but normal, then Bonacci centrality would be equal to this now, what is this? This is the total effect of the shock of units. So every, every get one unit shock, every entity. And then you subtract this shock. So this is something like the sum of the indirect effects. So it seems that Banach centrality with, with, with alpha is one uh, would be high for those who are accumulating these indirect effects, especially the strong. And I don't know if uh, other alpha would have any interpretation. I think not, because in some sense, matrix of partial correlations already uh, dampens the, the, uh, the dependencies. Okay, so this is what I uh, had about this pa first part, the theoretical part, then we applied it, we applied using uh, financial entities in Australia, we took the publicly available data, we filter returns using some econometric technique, this is called dynamical conditional correlation, in order to get the correlation matrix being dependent on the previous in order to take into account some time effects which are known in the financial econometrics. And then when we get this R, so we started with some returns they called Y here. Every Y uh, is a vector. So, it, I mean, it, it is, of course, it has time, but you also have many of these Ys because you have many entities. And then eventually you find this R, which is the correlation between them, and, but, but it is updated, so it has RT. Okay, so from here we get P. Uh, as I said, we didn't have any, any data, so we used the data stream which were available. So this is a publicly traded banks, six publicly traded banks in Australia, big four, two regional banks. There are a number of sectors of real economy and major international markets for Australia. So we have these uh, 14 years of data, 3,600 observations, but what we did, so first of all, we, we, we built a network on the day when we did it, so that was 22nd of August of 2014. Uh, and then to see how, how it is robust, we also build some networks in different time periods. And each time when we build this, we have, for our uh, DCC procedure, we use this size, 1,215 previous periods in order to evaluate dynamic correlation. Okay, so that's the data. This is the network which we got. Uh, again, so the, the, these are the entities you see, for example, these four are the four large banks in Australia. These are two regional banks, and then you see the sectors. You have the Asia market here, Europe market, and North American market. There is a cutoff level here in terms of partial correlations equal to 0 0.075, so others are not shown. Uh, okay, so in the, 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 the width of the, of the link is, of course, the size of this partial correlation. So what we see is that, for example, the banks, the four big banks are uh, related to each other uh, quite strongly. They are not all related to other sectors, but they are related indirectly to other sectors, for example, through financial service sectors. And uh, other sectors are uh, over here. The small banks are related to each other, related a little bit to the big four and the financial sectors. We have a very strong relation with real estate and financial sectors, which uh, Okay, so just, just a finding, which makes sense, I think. Interestingly, here there are these uh, other markets. So you see that, for example, uh, Australia, all the sectors in Australia are not really correlated to the North American and to European market, but they do have uh, an impact through them, right? So through this channel. Uh, this is probably because the trading in Asia market is overlapping in time with the trading in the Australian market. 
it overlaps partially with Europe, and Europe overlaps partially with North America. So it, only in this case, we may say that this is actually this directional um, uh, causality, because Europe is late, and North America is even later. But, but again, I remind there are no any causality here. <laughs> so, OK, so then we, we checked a little bit the stability of it, and it turned out that this is pretty stable. You, you probably don't see it from here, but well, the, the, the four banks are always there, so that's, that's good. Well, in terms of centrality measures, we found that eigenvector centrality is, uh, so if you scale them the largest, it will be for financial services. Financial services, then INZ and Westpac, these are two uh, banks in Australia. But for example, Bonacci centrality is, is maybe different. It, it is actually high for North American and for Asian market. Um, and the financial services as well. Okay, so that's the, the example of this application. But to conclude, what we try to do, we, we try to link the graphical Gaussian models, those use partial correlation networks, with network literature. We, we establish some link between partial correlation and shock propagation in our interpretation of this network, and I discuss some network-based measures. Okay, and so what you found at the end, you saw, you saw the reconstructed networks for Australian financial institutions. Uh, now, what, what we want to do next, I mean, one of uh, natural steps would be to try to see if we have uh, actual data or if we have more direct data uh, to see whether, whether the network from them would be similar to this perceived network. Or we call it perceived because it's a network which comes from the market return. So it, actually reflects the perception of probably of people about the market. And that that's would be probably the next step. Okay, that's uh, it. Thank you for The partial correlation yeah, thing. Quite of common factor, would you say, or something like that, I mean, right? Just like the overall world economy would be the, the Heated. No, we don't. So to, to answer this shortly, we don't. And I I think we have to look at that. But you can just look at the variance. Of course. Of yeah, of course, we look on the variances and covariances, and also we look on conditional on what is in our uh, system. So you probably can answer this by including something else in the system and see what changes. So you just can see what the, let's see, explain variance out of this calculation, right? So this explains some fraction of the variance, like the total variance is in the... Yeah, 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 that's, that's uh, possible. Okay, thanks.